Welcome. This is a summary of the atmosphere unit in higher geography. The atmosphere is crucial to life on Earth and we're going to look at how it works. In higher geography, there are three aspects of the atmosphere you need to know about. First is what's known as the global heat budget. This is basically what happens to the energy coming in from the sun after it enters the atmosphere and why this energy is not evenly spread between the equator and the poles. Next is the way energy is redistributed from the equator to the poles by atmospheric circulation, surface winds and ocean currents. You need to be able to talk through each of these giving named examples. Finally, we focus in on West Africa and the movement of something called the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. You'll need to know what influences it and be able to describe and explain the patterns of rainfall it causes through the year. The atmosphere has four layers. In this unit, we mainly focus on the troposphere, the bottom layer of the atmosphere. It contains all of the weather and 75% of all the air. But the other layers are important too. The stratosphere is where the ozone layer is, and it protects us from UV radiation. The mesosphere is where meteorites burn up, and the thermosphere is where the aurora happens. So the first part of the atmosphere topic is the global heat budget. This refers to what happens to the energy coming from the sun as it passes through the atmosphere. If the energy coming from the sun is 100%, then you might be surprised to learn that only 52% actually reaches the Earth's surface. And that's because it's reflected and absorbed by the clouds, dust and gas. The extent to which an object reflects or absorbs light is known as the albedo, and this depends on how light or dark an object is. Clouds are light, which means they reflect more than they absorb. In percentage terms, they reflect 17% of the sun's energy and absorb about 4%. Dust, on the other hand, is darker, which means it absorbs more than it reflects. Again, in percentage terms, dust and gas in the atmosphere reflect 8% of the sunlight and absorb about 19%. When the sunlight reaches the Earth's surface, about 46% of it is absorbed by the land and the water. 6% is reflected, but that's not going to be the same across the Earth's surface. The poles, being whiter due to the prevalence of snow and ice, have a higher albedo. In other words, they tend to reflect more of that energy. Whereas the equator, being darker, for instance due to the foliage of the rainforest, has a lower albedo and tends to absorb a bit more. The second part of the global heat budget is the difference between the equator and the poles. At the equator, energy coming in from the sun heats up a very small area, so therefore this area is very intensely heated. It's because it's coming in directly, compared to the poles where it's coming in at an angle and is therefore spread and dispersed over quite a large area. Linked to this is the distance the energy has to travel through the atmosphere. You can see here at the equator, it's a short distance, so not much energy is reflected and absorbed. As you can see near the poles, it's traveling through a greater distance of atmosphere because it's coming in at an angle, so there's more reflection and absorption. The albedo has an effect here as well. In the poles, where we have a lot of white surfaces because of the snow and ice, the albedo is high, and that means it's reflecting more energy. Towards the equator, the albedo is lower, absorbing more of the sun's energy. And that's because it's mainly greens and blues because of the rainforest and the ocean. There's also seasonal variation. Towards the pole in winter, above a certain latitude, the sun barely gets above the horizon, if it does at all. These areas get little or no sun for months of the year, which means the average temperature is going to be a lot lower. At the tropics, the sun is high in the sky for most of the year, so on average these regions are going to have a higher temperature. So we have a surplus of energy at the equator and a deficit towards the poles. This energy is transferred across the planet by atmospheric circulation, surface winds and ocean currents. The next section is the redistribution of energy. I'm going to start with the atmosphere. You can see that there's a three cell model First, let's look at the cells closest to the equator, known as Hadley cells. And if we start at the equator, 
the hot air rises, leaving an area of low pressure. This then spreads out to the north and the south before sinking at about 30 degrees, creating an area of high pressure. There are then surface winds taking the air from the high pressure back to the low pressure at the equator, completing the Hadley cell. These variations in pressure at different latitudes have a profound effect on the weather and in turn on the land. At the equator, low pressure leads to convectional rainfall. This is where we tend to find the rainforests. At 30 degrees north and south, high pressure leads to hot, dry weather, so we often find deserts. In the far north and south, we find polar cells. At the poles, the air is very cold, and therefore it sinks. This cold air sinking at the poles creates high pressure and makes it very dry. It then spreads out in all directions, eventually meeting warm air coming from the tropics. And at around 60 degrees, where the warmer air rises, it causes low pressure, and that makes it very wet and windy. In between, from 60 degrees to 30 degrees, north and south, we have feral cells. And this is driven by the Hadley cell and the polar cell. You can see the movement of air here, but in reality, it can be influenced by other factors. Surface winds are important in all of this. In general, the global wind system is created by air blowing from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. But it isn't quite so simple. The surface winds are the bottom parts of the Hadley, Farrell and the polar cell. They effectively move from high pressure to low pressure, but they're deflected by the Coriolis effect. This is because of the spinning Earth. In the northern hemisphere, they're deflected to the right in the direction that they're going. And in the southern hemisphere, they're deflected to the left in the direction they're going. And this creates the trade winds, the westerlies and the polar easterlies. This pattern is further interrupted. Above the polar front is the jet stream. This is a very, very high powered wind going right the way around the world. It swings to the south and north, and that's called Rossby waves. And that helps to draw cold air south and warm air north, helping to mix up the cold and the warm air. Differences in heating of the land and sea, particularly in places like the Indian subcontinent, creates onshore and offshore winds interrupting this pattern and creating the monsoon system. This whole system, winds, circulation cells, moves north in June and south in December due to the Earth's 23 and a half degree tilt in relation to its orbit. Earth's oceans also play an important role in redistributing energy around the globe. In fact, about 25% of the global heat budget is transferred by ocean currents. Because they cover 67% of the Earth's surface, the ocean receives 67% of the energy from the sun that reaches the planet's surface. Water holds onto this heat for longer than the land does, and the ocean currents move this heat around. In general, energy moves from an area of surplus to an area of deficit, so currents help transfer surplus heat from the tropics to fill the deficit at the poles. You also need to be able to talk about how ocean currents help to redistribute energy around the world. Warm currents transfer warm water up towards the poles. At the poles, the cold water is denser, so it sinks and flows towards the equator where the water is warmer and less dense. You can see similar patterns of movement repeated around the world. I'm going to focus on the North Atlantic, but you may have studied other parts of the world. Currents are mainly pushed by surface winds and the trade winds here push water towards the west. It's then deflected by the continents to the north and the south. It's also aided by the Coriolis effect. Because of the spinning earth, water is deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. This sets up the clockwise motion in the North Atlantic called the North Atlantic Gyre and the anticlockwise motion in the South Atlantic, the South Atlantic Gyre. You also need to be able to name these currents. So the motion across the equator is the equatorial current. You then have the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic Drift transferring warm water into the Arctic. There are return cold currents like the Labrador Current and the Canaries Current bringing cold water back towards the equator. Salinity differences, particularly off the coast of Greenland, help to drive this further. Water that changes into ice leaves salt behind. 
and that salty water is therefore very dense and starts to sink. That makes the Gulf Stream a lot stronger by drawing more water north. So the final thing you could be asked is about the Intertropical Convergence Zone, the ITCZ, and the effect that it has on the rainfall patterns of West Africa. The ITCZ itself is a zone at the thermal equator where the trade winds meet. The thermal equator receives the most intense heat from the sun and it shifts as the earth tilts on its axis in relation to the sun. And therefore in January, it's further south and it moves north in July. It brings convectional rainfall because it's the hottest part. Associated with that are air masses. To the north, you have tropical continental air. This is formed over the Sahara Desert, so it tends to be very dry. And to the south, you have tropical maritime air, which is formed over the South Atlantic, so it tends to be very wet. As the ITCZ moves north and south, it brings this air with it as well. In January, the ITCZ is quite far south. And that means that tropical continental air is dominating West Africa, making this very, very dry. The daily convectional rainfall is right down here near the coast. In July, as it moves north, not only does it bring the daily convectional rainfall, but it also brings tropical maritime air across the continent, making it much wetter. In the exam, there are two things that you'll need to do. First of all, you might be asked to describe and compare the rainfall patterns on maps and climate graphs. And then you might need to relate this to the movement of the ITCZ and the air masses. When you're asked to describe and compare rainfall patterns, it might be on maps or it might be on climate graphs. This particular map shows isohyets, lines of equal rainfall, and you can see that Lagos in the south has just over 1,500 millimetres of annual rainfall. You would need to describe this and also the other cities on this map. When describing graphs, it's important to give actual figures. If you were asked to describe these graphs, you'd want to pick out maximum and minimum values and the months that they occur in. You'd want to describe the total amount of rainfall and also where there are wet seasons and dry seasons. Quite often in the south, cities have more than one peak, and it's important to acknowledge this and give the values for each of the peaks. You would then need to be able to explain these patterns, and that's by talking about the movement north and south of the ITCZ and the associated air masses. You need to pick out that the peaks of rainfall are likely to be when the ITCZ with the convectional rainfall comes in. So this explains the double peak as the ITCZ moves north and then moves south again. In behind that comes the tropical maritime air mass, which explains the wet season. The dry seasons are caused by the ITCZ moving south and bringing tropical continental air mass, making these areas particularly dry. These are a selection of past exam questions. In 2015, it was about atmospheric circulation and the surface winds. In 2016, it was about the ITCZ. In 2017, it was the global heat budget. And in 2019, it was about ocean currents. None of them should now be a surprise.